Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimbo? Oh, Tyson, it's a it's a beautiful day here in St. Louis. It's still chilly. I don't know why in the middle of April it's it's still so darn cold, but it's a beautiful day. How are you doing? Doing well. I I mean, I just three minutes ago got out or four minutes ago got out of an airplane. So uh, beautiful weather in Columbia, Missouri. I'll tell you, no no real winds, but you're right. It's crisp outside. Definitely colder than I want it to be, but we I think we just got over the hump, Jimmy. I think we just got over. I think the weather is going to start to turn real, real nice. I hope so. I hope so. Well, let's go ahead and get to our guest. Our guest today is John Ting. He's a very fun and exciting and successful immigration lawyer out of Houston, Texas. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jim and Tyson. Appreciate uh, being invited on. You bet. So, John, tell us about your journey and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, well, number one, I, I appreciate uh, Brian Manning inviting me on to the Maxim Lawyer and the Guild uh, for the, my journey. So it started, I graduated 2011 from City University of New York, CUNY Law School, with a public interest uh, mind and mission. And even so when I applied for law school, I already knew that I wanted to practice immigration law. More so after under, understanding that a lot of people don't have the ability to exercise due process. So I, I ended up just starting my own uh, law practice straight from law school. Mm. Um, a lot of people ask, I did not take the New York bar. I just went, moved back to Texas and took the bar there and started my own practice. After about five, seven years, I had a, um, well, five, six years, then I, I had a partner for a couple of years thinking that was my ticket to semi-freedom, I suppose. So uh, as you'll notice, part of my, the theme of my talk this summer at the Maxim Lawyer Conference is about achieving that freedom. Now, of course, uh, I'll just do my, li my little tidbit about that um, in my own way, but uh, I think I'm re getting to that point. I'm along that journey with that intention in mind. So not many people start uh, law firm right out of law school. What, uh, what surprised you the most about that process and what um, do you wish you had known when you started? Uh, ooh, I wish, well, fortunately I had mentors here and there in different areas, I suppose you can say, but there were really, there was not a group like this, as you, as you know, because you created it. And um, for asking things like, oh, well, a conflict of interest type situation. Okay. Well, you know, you look up the Texas Bar Journal, for example, and that's all there is, is and they're all old information. And sure, there's a hotline, but a group like yours is has been very significantly helpful, I'm sure, for many others. So I've got a follow-up question to that. If you were to if you were given the chance, right, would you do it the same way or would you have gone and worked for a firm first? I still would have started my own practice. So what did it, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Oh, uh, what sorry. did it look, John, what did it look like in those first couple months, those first two years, say? What, talk to, describe for the audience what your firm looked like then, what kind of a person you were running that firm at that time. So I, I do want to give credit to my, uh, my, my parents for starting their own business. That definitely helped. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not like I went through a training course through them. It was just on the job post-college, like, okay, help out since you don't have a job yet. And then, uh, so just from that experience, they had a convenience store. So that helped me, even my mom to this day is like, you need to be kind to your clients. They're paying you to do work for them. Don't get frustrated, you know, things like that. And she, she always told me that um, anything that you're experiencing now at my store, you will experience something similar in your practice. So suck it up. <laughs> essentially enjoy the ride <clears throat> um so with your practice sorry i thought you were done no go ahead <clears throat> well I i'm just curious like with your practice um you and jim both can practice all over the country and you can target people all over the country um, is that something you do or do you focus just in in, in texas that's a great question. Yeah, we immigration law, we can practice uh, accept clients really living from anywhere uh, or they are living from anywhere as well. Um, 
but that wasn't that's the 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 huge difference in intention from the first seven years until the last three years i suppose you can say is the ability to thinking about scaling to some extent not just accepting people in person i mean even that that mindset started happening for me in 2000, late 2018 when my first uh, child was born because I had to do everything remotely. Um, my wife and I are co-parenting from day one, essentially. So, you know, even I was telling people, hey, you can just save time from traffic. You don't have to drive to my office. They were uh, not really understanding that until, of course, the pandemic happened. So, mm -hmm. And so what... Are you enjoying about the practice of law? What what's sort of driving you crazy, or that you're trying to improve? Well, um, it's it's about anticipating the future, right? So as we're growing the team, y'all know that I've been increasing the the VAs. I also plan on hiring another associate, my second one, this within the next uh, one or two months, hopefully. Uh, with increased cases, I just I don't have the bandwidth to do it myself anymore. And I've I can, I can and anticipate that and acknowledge it currently. And, um, but also um, some things that I see in the both Facebook groups and that is into, uh, experiencing hardships or uh, conflict with employees, just getting ready for that. And so before I joined Maxim Lawyer, I I've been still part of Entree Leadership. And that's what I gained the most from that group, at least, is how to how to deal with employees, essentially, resolve those conflicts. Well, let's talk about that, that part of it, though, like the hiring part of it, um, getting over the whole, you know, the, the fear of hiring employees and hiring associates. Walk us through all that, because, I mean, there's a lot to unwrap when it comes to hiring employees. Sure. Well, I can tell you my context of why I delayed uh, hiring an associate, and it could be very similar to most solos, and that is, I don't know if I'm going to have enough money in the bank to pay that XYZ employee and, or if it's even a paralegal, right? But um, once I started understanding, not, 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 much, not so much marketing strategy, but more so like how to anticipate revenue, because before I always thought like, well, it all really depends on that one individual if they sign up. But if you have a certain strat specific strategy, so it goes kind of hand in hand, right? Then, you know, I, I started realizing after talking to marketing experts, essentially expect to spend at least 10% of your anticipated revenue. So just building that budget, I realized, okay, well, an associate in Houston may be like 60 to 80,000. And of course you pay higher than you're going to um, expect a better qualified employee, you know? So I think that was my uh, mindset. One of my mindset blocks a couple years ago. John, one of the things I've noticed about you is that you're you're pretty systematic and that you've done you do a lot of back end work to make sure that things are sort of organized and systematized. Talk to our listeners a little bit about your mindset when it comes to systems. Sure. So um, it, at first, I thought immigration practice is like a unique situation where things seem more systematized, but after speaking with conversing with a lot of folks on the, in the groups, it, it can be done really in most, if not all practice areas. And the, I was, I still use some uh, software called 17 hats. And so one feature they have is workflow. So essentially step one is uh, after they sign up onboarding, step two, X, Y, Z, it can send an email, it can send a questionnaire, it can be automated. You don't even have to click go or send, or you can have it wait for your approval. And that also includes like emails, invoices. So when I, when I stumbled upon 17 hats, well, it went, came through Facebook feed a couple, like five years ago, I've been using that really since 2017, 2018. So all my former team members that uh, branched off because I moved from Dallas to Houston, they call me, they're like, John, help my current employer switch over. I'm like, I'm happy to do it. I'm like it's, it saves me so much time. So let's so talk a little bit more about the, the systems and, and the policies and the procedures and all that. So as you begin to scale, as you add to more, more employees, you're going to have to teach people these things. So how are you managing your, your systems and your policies and your procedures? 
Yeah, you know what? I, uh, I've always known about Loom.com, for example. That's one of the software, video software, that I think one of the more common ones. And then I think when I joined the guild, that's when I started realizing, holy crap, like, yeah, I can use this for sales. I can use this for um, training the team internally. And uh, so I, I now use dub.com for sales videos and also for, for clients. So, so for Jim, for immigration, for example, I have like, I don't know, five to eight video series, one minute each, just about how to prep for like a adjustment interview and one for naturalization. It has saved me what, like minimum 30 minutes to an hour per client. Um, so it's, it's just saved me a lot of time. So I highly recommend that. You're listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Our guest today is immigration attorney extraordinaire John Ting out of Houston. John, talk to us about business development. How do you like to focus on marketing when it comes to bringing in new clients? So the past, uh, before the pandemic, the first five years or so is like going strong on networking, going to bar events, things like that. Then my wife was pregnant and I was like, there's no time. This is before the pandemic, right? So I had to think of other ways. And of course, Jim Hacking's the guru on YouTube. Ah. So watched uh, several videos of his. So I, was like, I was still hesitant, like I'm sure many others. And then pandemic hit. And that's when I was like, well, I've always wanted to do know your rights type workshops. I've done them in person, but I was like, there's got to be another way. I just got to get over my fear. And and you know this, Jim, but like YouTube or any type of social media is really the best way. I know people are like wondering, like, which, which uh, platform should I use? Just pick one at least. You really can duplicate it. What's this right on your phone anyway? All you need is a phone, right? We all have smartphones now. So um, even when my internet wasn't working at the office one day, I just used my phone to, to log into StreamYard. It wasn't perfect, but I just got it done. and. Um, but then I realized, okay, they're calling, kind of like, you know, the old school yellow, uh, what do you call that? The yellow book? Yellow pages. Yellow pages. And, uh, and I've, I tried something like that. I wasn't yellow pages, but I tried like this, uh, the Spanish version of the Dallas Morning News, Aldea. Yeah, we got a lot of calls, but then some people are like, oh, but you, it says free consultation. Of course, uh, back then, the first seven years, I was like, oh, yeah, we charge for that. But now I predominantly is free. 15 minutes. Um, but anyway, uh, to, so it's my summer talk at the conference will be uh, similar to this, this topic actually is when you attract them through YouTube and other means, what do you do after that? And so what we have is a free guide. It's a document, a PDF. It's everything you know already. It's already items that people ask, like common FAQs. So it, it, you've already built the trust through social media. And now they want to you want to sustain that. You want to show that your continued um, credibility, your knowledge, um, you share that with them. So it's kind of like you go to an event, right, in person, and someone hands you like a random flyer. It's essentially the same thing, except in that situation, there's no trust built in. But if you have something to attract them, like a landing page or your social media, that, that's built in credibility. So that's, that's what I've changed the past couple of years in terms of marketing. So, John, with you doing more more of the marketing, I guess walk us through your typical day. I mean, are you doing more of running the business? Or are you more practicing the law? Walk us through that. Yeah, it's really like 50-50. Uh, but my goal is, you all probably read in, on, in the Guild, is my goal is to exit. Okay, so uh, it doesn't mean necessarily 100%. I know it sounds strange for me to say it out loud, but after going through the Goldman Sachs program, it, it was an intensive eight weeks, especially when – my son was born around that time. I was like, this is homework. But the key thing, it was in the last week, and that was to exit. I was like, lawyers can exit? That's crazy. I thought we had to be a lawyer until we die. So, um, but yeah, I'm not necessarily thinking like sell 100% of the law firm, but to scale the, I guess the point is to the journey, to scale it to a point where you have the ability, you have the opportunity to sell it. And so, um, yeah, that's just, been mind-blowing. I'm just unlocking my, my mind blocks, essentially. 
So, but then getting to Tyson's question about what things look like now, like what walk us through sort of your typical day now in 2022. Yeah, sorry. So I always, I always want to share context and I forgot the question. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I start my morning like around, yeah, after the kids go to school, then it's consults all day, really, because the past two months I've been training the associate to handle that, um, the new associate. But her her skill set is uh, more like an integrator because, and so I had her take the assessment. So with that in mind, I, I've already created like a hierarchy chart and just anticipating needs. And so I'm I would say fifty percent of my day is um, working on the business. It's just even though I preach about time blocking, I'm not as good as it I was as I would hope. I, I think that's more so because my excuse is the little kids. So my day pretty much shuts down 3.34. Yeah. Uh, so now I assign, for example, having an associate for, for those true solos. One, because we all, like some people think, I talk to my friends all the time and they say like, well, I can do everything myself. And we all know we need to delegate, right? So even quote unquote simple tasks like research, Right, Jim, you know this, like we have a lot of immigration clients that just say like, can we do this? But like some things can change. So, but I don't have the time to research it anymore. So I just task my uh, associate and that's a great learning experience for her anyway. And for me, because after she does the grunt work of it, then I can double check it quickly. So that's just, so, uh, you know, one thing off my plate, at least in terms of my day. So I, I have an interesting question um, because with your plan to exit, right? And you, cause you want to kind of, I guess, be out of the business at, at a certain point. What does your vision look like? I, and how do you, cause we talk about vision all the time and conveying that to your employees and, and how important that is, but I guess how, what does your vision look like and how do you express that to your employees? Yeah. So I've been upfront with them. Uh, Y'all know I have a team of VAs, virtual assistants uh, that work outside of America. And uh, I've told them, look, this is, this is a growing opportunity for everyone. So as we grow, I mean, I don't share the, the numbers with them in terms of the, the dollars, but, uh, and I don't think they need to know that they're uh, a bulk of my VAs have been with this, been with me for about a year. So uh, it's just great to see their development and them actually wanting to, when they see someone is sick or out for any reason, they're like, how can I help? So that's uh, just building that culture is critical for scaling and exiting. And um, so, but yeah, long-term is uh, integrating a, I guess you could tr traditionally we call it of counsel, right? But so something like that, but for um, work from home, um, workers. I, I don't want to call them employees yet, but I imagine it'd be more like 1099 contractors where we're more like the call center, the marketing hub and call center and slash document gathering center, handle all the client um, concerns, you could say, uh, the help desk, and then the attorney handles all like the hearings, things like that. And so that was part of my uh, through the guild, I think the hot seat, I think it was in August for me or September last year. And part of me was like, man, I really don't want to stop accepting XYZ type of removal proceeding cases. You know, that's the reason I went to law school, really help people in that kind of situation, that bind. But there's got to be another way. So it took about three to six months to figure out a way. And I've talked to some attorney friends and who practice immigration and they don't want anything to deal with, as you can imagine, the client part of it, right? They just wanted to be, have that feeling of getting the, the work done and uh, they don't want to go to an office at all. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great point, John, about sort of finding what people like and what they're good at. And, and when we talk about growing this firm, I always tell people that there's plenty of work to be done and there's plenty of growth to happen that we need to um, find out what people's strengths are and then play to that strength and sort of get other people to deal with things that everyone else is weak at so if if one person's really good at client communication then 
you know, let them run with that and then find out what each person's strength is. I think, I think so often we just try to get so rigid about, you know, we have this position to fill and we have to find the perfect person for this position as opposed to really digging in, finding out what people's strengths are, where their energy lies and what they like to do and building the firm a little bit more organically. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Like for example, a recent example is one or two weeks ago, we just created a TikTok uh, channel per se. And, and I already knew who would be wanting to participate in that. And, I already, and it confirmed with me who did not because I asked individually who wants to be involved in this channel or not. I don't want to dump everyone in that group. Uh, but, uh, and I was right. I, after like at least six months with them to a year, I, I have an idea what they prefer. Of course, everyone uh, takes the personality assessment, but that doesn't necessarily say like which, which specific role they ex would excel at or even be interested in. And then I, once, when a couple of the VA said, yeah, I'll, I want to help with X, Y, Z, like social media, for example, or client calling clients, um, for certain reasons. I was like, I looked back at their application. I was like, bingo. Like they actually selected that as one of the options. I just, I was just so gung ho. Like you said, like uh, as uh, law firm owners, we're like, we just need to fill this position. But after over time, please, I recommend looking back at their application and see what they selected. So what I do in my part of my application is I just list all the needs that will, you'll continually need to fill over the years. And then, um, I mean, most people select like at least half of them. So that'll give you a running start. That's great advice. Um, we're getting close to time, but real quick, I want to ask you, the with TikTok, give, give us a few tips on starting with TikTok for people that have not started with it yet. Uh, well, yeah, well, Tyson, you know, you got a tip for me the other, uh, the other yeah, day. Yeah, that's uh, great. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone can fly planes, but um, hmm. uh, yeah, I know one, one tip that people hear all the time is be yourself, right? Like, I, one thing that stopped me is like, oh, I need to look a certain way. Even my family's like, you need to shave. I'm like, no, I need to look a little older, actually. <laughs> so just be yourself and uh, um, use a uh, call to action, okay? So you may have a lot of subscribers and followers, people that watch, but they don't do anything after watching your video. But maybe six months later, like, oh, you know what? I should have called that person. And one thing that reminded me of this, other than the algorithm and all those kind of things, is uh, I shared uh, I rented from an, uh, another attorney who, uh, when I first started practice ten years ago, and he he talked to his neighbors and he was he told me one of his neighbors got a personal injury lawyer and but he actually practices PI, and he was telling neighbor why didn't you you know consider hiring me? He was like oh I forgot. So social media fills that gap. Even though you could be, you might think like even content, there's plenty of content. In, like, I mean, at least for immigration, we have at least, I mean, many consultations a day, which is why I need to hire another associate, right? But uh, there's plenty of, and just one question from a consult is content right there, right? And Jim knows that as well. So, but even if you felt like you're repeating content, who cares? Because they might not have seen your other videos. It's just the, the random, well, not, I guess not random, but the algorithm, right? The feed. Um, so don't worry about content. So such a good point. Uh, great, 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 uh, advice. Lots of great advice in this episode. Um, we do need to wrap things up, uh, before I do, I want to remind everyone to join us in the big Facebook group. A lot of great free information in there. If you want a more high level conversation, join us in the guild, people like John Ting in the guild, maxlawguild.com. Make sure you, if you want to go to the conference, go to maxlawcon2022.com to get your tickets uh, before we sell out. So make sure you do that. And while you're listening to the rest of this episode, if you don't mind giving us a five-star review, we would greatly appreciate it. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? So I'm getting ready to go to a three-day retreat with other business owners. And I'm excited about that. They gave us some homework to do. And one of the questions I found to be pretty provocative, and I thought I would ask it here and let people sort of reflect on it as, as a prompt. And the question is, what questions are seeking your attention at this time in your life? What questions are seeking your attention at this time in your life? I really enjoyed doing that. And I've still been uh, adding more questions to that. So that that's, that's a nice uh, reflection piece, I think, because it's not sort of 
you got to know everything. You got to have all the answers. Just what are the questions that are getting at you or that you're, you've been reflecting on or need to reflect on? So I thought I'd share that. I love it. That's good stuff. John, you're up next. What is your tip or hack of the week? I've been wanting to do this for a while, but uh, my, my recent hack is missiveapp.com. It's a shared inbox. Uh, it includes emails and uh, social media messaging, for example, and even live chat widget on your website. So imagine all your different tools like that you have in separate apps. This can pretty much do it all in one. It even includes, uh, I think, WhatsApp. I need to sync that myself. But this is called missiveapp.com. Missive, will you spell that? Oh, sure. M-I-S-S-I-V-E-A-P-P.com. That... So just to quickly explain one more thing about it is so, for example, I, I started thinking about something like this really when one team member was out two weeks in a month uh, for medical reasons. And so I was like, oh my goodness, like, yes, I have the password, but I have to log in every single time. So Missive app is similar to front uh, app.com or something like that. And even this one, you can, let's say the associate that you just recently hired and you just obviously don't trust hundred percent yet. And you say, okay, go draft the email. You don't have to Google doc it to me or anything or email it to me, draft it in that app and tag me when it's ready. So that's just one simple way of uh, checking without really having cool. to log in a different using credentials. I uh, I love that. That's awesome. I am. Uh, I've got it. I've got another shiny shiny ball to go chase after. Um, Jim might too. The uh, I just you made me think of something. Um, you should call your people Ting members, like John Ting Ting members. I think it would be, <laughs> be awesome. Um, anyways. So my, mine's a non-legal tip. So we, I, we garden, right? We love gardening. And so we bought a Lomi, L-O-M-I, and it composts paper, it composts uh, food scraps, um, plastics. It composts that stuff within like hours. It is incredible. So we've been, I've been doing it every single day. And it like within hours, it, it turns your stuff into compost and you just put it in the garden. So that's my tip. Low me. It's a non-legal tip, but you know, sometimes we need that stuff for, for hobbies. So cool. John, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, man. Really, really appreciate it. I, there are a lot of great nuggets. So I think people need to go back and re-listen to this because there's a lot of great nuggets in here. So hopefully people get a lot out of it. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. And everyone, please come out uh, this June for Max Law Con. Nice. Thanks for the plug, John. Appreciate it. Bye, guys.